so um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak today. I think today's a really, uh, we're facing a really important global challenge. We need to find a way to feed the people of the world a healthy diet in a fair and equitable way without destroying the planet. There is no challenge more important at the current time than that. And the time to, to, to address that challenge is now. And the reason I think it's important to address the challenge is because we have knowledge. We know what the link is between food production and anthropogenic climate change. We understand that there are links between the food that we eat and our health, whether that's in terms of obesity or whether that's in terms of living well because of our diet choices. We know that food is linked to poverty and social deprivation um, across the globe, both here in the UK and elsewhere. We know that our food system is increasingly complicated and it's, it's a product both of the global value chains uh, that supply our food and also the complexity of the kinds of foods we want and when we want to eat them. And we know that that some of the challenges that we're experiencing today are getting worse. Climate change, anthropogenic climate change is accelerating. And you can only you only need to look at, at COP26 uh, the, in the last week to, to see the evidence of that. We also know that our food system is fragile. COVID-19 has ex exposed real challenges with the food system, both in terms of the value chains and also our ability to supply food that we want to eat and at the time that we want to eat it. And we also know that there is a problem of global society, it's changing. There's a shift towards nationalism and trade is at the heart of that. And we're seeing disputes between the United States and China um, on trade and food, which are then um, having knock on effects for the rest of us. Now, I think the UK is in a unique position to respond to these challenges in a new and innovative way. Firstly, it's in a period following its exit from the European Union last year. So it has an opportunity to produce new policies, new regulation and think in new ways. And we can already see um, that happening. Um, we're also coming out of COVID-19, uh, hopefully, and um, there's an opportunity for really leveling up and seeing uh, regulation and food and the interaction between food, the environment and health in, in new ways. But I think what we're actually seeing in the UK is a fragmented approach. So trade is moving forward. There's a national food strategy, there is innovation in the environmental bill, we've already had the Agriculture Act and the Trade Act, but these policies don't fit together. And in, in actual fact, some would say um, that um, the, the trade policy is moving ahead um, before the food strategy and environmental strategy are truly embedded domestically. So it's a time of opportunity, but a time of challenge. So what I want to do today in my talk is present to you uh, an innovative uh, research project that I have the privilege to lead that delivers trade, uh, sustainable trade uh, in a, with positive outcomes for health um, and uh, the environment. So, as I said, the, the proposal, uh, it, we're at the proposal stage. We've, uh, we've got through the first round and we're on the second round now. And it's an ambitious project. Um, we're looking at sustainable trade in sustainable food systems with a focus on soy. Uh, I'm, I'm privileged to lead an amazing interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team with colleagues from across the University of Leeds, but also across the N8 consortium of universities with special, specialty in, in agri-food. Um, colleagues come from uh, many disciplines, so from the natural sciences, so climate impacts, life cycle analysis, food systems analysis, livestock modelling, to name a few. 
and also the social sciences. So we had economics and, and law in there, and we also have um, some sociology. Um, and as on top of that, we also have uh, expertise from supply chain operations and business management. And what we've done is we've put law right at the heart of the project. Um, we're going to be looking at law and regulation as the problem um, in, in how you achieve sustainable trade, uh, as well as the solution. And we're also going to be working uh, in a multidisciplinary way. And I use that term in its most expansive sense. We're going to be working together at each stage of the project and on each aspect of the project. And I think this makes us unique. So we'll we will be producing a new methodology of multidisciplinary research that hopefully will also transcend um, the project. So why are we focusing on soy trade? Well, I've got seven reasons for that, which I'll, I'll skirt over quite quickly so I can get to the, the um, the core of, of the, the, the project and what we're planning to do. So why are we focusing on soy? Well, firstly, soy is important. So you can see on the slide there that soy is one of the most important crops and each of us here in Europe um, and the UK obviously uh, consumes about an average of 61 kilograms per year. And on the slide, you can see um, the sort of, um, not only the soybean, but also the processing of soy into multiple different products. Soy itself is a legume. It was domesticated in Northeast China around 3000 years ago, and it became a key staple of the uh, diet in East Asia. And it only came over to, the, to Europe and America in about the 1730s, 1760s. Um, what we've seen since then is an explosion of uh, soy production in line with demand for things like fats and oils. And so by the mid 20th century, soy is, has become a major crop cash crop um, with multiple uses across the chain. So what is it used for? Well, it's highly versatile. So it's used in foods, it's used in biodiesel, and it also has industrial uses as well in cosmetics and in some um, chemicals. But I want to focus particularly on its uses uh, in food. So we can think about it in terms of direct consumption. Uh, we might um, consume the soybean in the form of the endomame beans, as you see the bird's eye product there. Um, we might have it in yogurt or in milk. Um, we might even have the beans or, or the oil. So we might consume it directly. It could be a food additive as well. Soy lysethin is often uh, used in, in foods and is, is a form, sometimes uh, people are allergic to that. But by far the largest uh, way that we consume soy is um, through our consumption of um, meat protein um, where the livestock has been fed on soya. So we're consuming it indirectly because we're consuming the animals that have been fed on soya, so primarily um, pigs and poultry. So in that case, the soya is embedded. So we've got direct consumption and embedded soy. So where does it come from? So, Soy is a, has been described as a high value, high volume, not picky product. So it can grow in many places, including the UK, and we do have small production of it, mostly in the southeast of the country. But by far and away, there are five major producers of soy in the world. And you can see those um, depicted on the graph there. Um, the three dominant ones are Argentina, Brazil, and the United States. And if we were to take the land entirely given over to soy production throughout the world, it's in 2018, it was about 125 million acres, which is the size, um, equivalent size of South Africa. So it's a major amount. So the soy grown in the UK is mostly non, um, not genetically modified, but throughout the world, we see genetically modified soy, um, non-genetically modified and also organic um, soy. Um, so, so concentration of um, production primarily uh, in these um, three to five countries. 
Soy is also a um, globally traded product. There are over 170 countries that are involved in the trade in soy, whether that's exporting or importing. I've already talked about the major producers and, and, and exporters of soy, and by far and away, the largest importer of soy is China. And um, in 2017, China imported 85 million tons of the 150 million tons of soy that were produced in the world in that year. And as you see from the graph, this is a USDA um, projection uh, graph, China's consumption is expected to rise to 200, 200 million metric tons by 2029. Now, is that a problem? Well, yes, it is, because the UK imports about three and a half million tons of soy a year for various uses, um, animal feed and, and direct consumption. And it is competing in this very dynamic global market uh, where you've got these major suppliers and then China on the other side is a, a major consumer. The other thing we know about soy is it has a very particular value chain and Tony Heron, uh, colleagues at York, uh, had a look at the concentration of the soy value chain in, in, a, um, in earlier research. And what we find with the soy value chain is that it's marked by a very high concentration and control with uh, of a small number of firms that we as consumers may not um, see. And what we see there is um, agrochemical firms that are increasingly concentrated, firms like Bayer Monsanto, uh, Syngenta that now incorporates ChemChina and Dow DuPont on one side, and major commodity traders on the other um, companies like Cargill and Louis Dreyfus. And what's interesting about some of these commodity traders in particular is they're not publicly traded on stock exchange. So not only do we not see them uh, and their activities as consumers because they're sort of in, inside the chain, if you like, but also they're not um, their activities are not really um, open to the same sort of public scrutiny as those that would be on the stock exchange. So that's not to say there's anything necessarily problematic, but the, the sort of visibility that you might see in other chains is not present. Now, the problems with soy production uh, and trade are quite well known. So I'm just going to highlight a few. The major one is that soy in Argentina, Brazil, and increasing of Bolivia and Paraguay is grown on land that is deforested um, in the Amazon rainforest, um, the Curado and the Grand Cacao regions. Uh, they're under threats of biodiversity loss and the significant um, habitat loss and sequestration loss. A link to that, there's incredible impact, adverse impact on the indigenous peoples of the Amazon. There's a loss of firewood, their cultural identity is being destroyed as they're increasingly urbanized. They're moved out of the um, areas that are using, um, being cleared for soy. There's land conflicts between the indigenous peoples and, and sort of meat grab um, with the corporations. And another less known aspect of soy is that soy is often associated with very positive impacts on human health because it's a meat substitute, uh, protein substitute in plant-based diets. But there are food safety uh, issues that we need to be careful of, including salmonella on the plants, on the soy, which can find its way into the human food chain, either via the livestock uh, chain when we eat embedded soy or alternatively straight into the chain. So there is a risk of contaminants and because of the way that soy is traded and, and um, basically all the sources are put together, traceability of the product is not always as easy as, as it could be. Um, so tracing the, the contaminants can be problematic, although digital technology is helping to address that. So we need to do something and we need to do it soon. But, and here's the interesting thing, soy is a well-researched product. There's multidisciplinary research, there's government research, there's academic research, there's NGO research, and it's a highly regulated space. There's public research, there's public regulation in the form of international trade rules, World Trade Organization rules um, do touch 
on um, trading commodities. Um, I can say a little bit more about that. We've also got trade agreements between countries that have specific environmental health and gender human rights elements in them that touch on, on this area. Despite um, what might be commonly assumed, there's actually a lot of private sector regulation here as well. So the companies like Cargill, Louis Dreyfus have their own certification um, for soy to try and, and increase positive, um, positive impacts on health and, and also the environment and, and lessen the adverse effects. And I could name several uh, regulatory uh, um, innovations and we should mention to the COP26 declaration on forests and land use, uh, which came out early November. So it's a regulated space and it's a research space, but we still got problems. So what's going wrong? And this is where our project intervened. What I think is going wrong is this, and, and my team think these are the problems. Law is not regarded as a dynamic part of this problem. And it, it happens, this happens in two ways. The first is often lawyers are brought in at the end to fix a problem that other researchers have identified. So the, the, the lawyers are there just like car mechanics to come in at the end and, and make the project work. So that's one problem. The second is that um, the problem can be seen as static and then law is saying, well, how does law add to this problem? Well, the problem can then be fixed and not dynamic. So the complexity and the, the changing nature of the relationship between law and the problem and law and the other disciplines is not explored. So the lawyer becomes a car mechanic coming in at the last minute rather than a dynamic part of the discussion. But also the lawyer can become the problem because when presented with the issue, um, the complexity I've just outlined, the lawyer can say, ah, this is a rights problem. I need to apply human rights to this. Ah, it's a sustainability problem. I need to look at, at sustainability and apply that. Ah, it's a trade problem. I need to apply trade law. So the lawyer can, lawyers can actually silo the solutions. So then the regulation becomes part of the problem and that the legal thinking becomes part of the problem. So, and, and then it, mixes, it misses the complexity. So what do we need to do and what are we going to do in our projects? We need to see law as dynamic. We need to see as part of the problem, the way that it works, the things that it prioritizes, the voices, it, the voices that it prioritizes and the voices that it silences as dynamic and inherent in the, in the, in the research. The other thing we need is a fully integrated discussion where we don't have fragmented bits of research happening in within, within a multidisciplinary framework where the climate modelers go off and do their climate thing and then meet back together with the lawyers who've done their bit and the social scientists who've done their bit and then somehow the projects mix together. That's not what needs to happen. We all need to work together all the time and find um, a fully integrated method of research that then highlights what the challenges actually are. And one of the reasons I don't think this has been done is even from our initial discussions within the team, getting the language right and finding a way to communicate with each other, even on simple things like, what is a scenario? Um, we spent a lot of time working out what we were all talking about when we were talking about scenarios. So even simple things are com complex. So you need new methodology and you need um, to seek law at the heart. So this is our rather overwhelming slide. Um, and I'll say very quickly about what we propose to do, because as I say, we're hoping UKRI will look favorably on our projects. So what we're going to do is work together to produce a, um, to look at the UK's trade in soy at the moment, to look at its impact on health and to look at its impact on the environment. We're going to do that through a sort of mapping exercise. So, um, so the lawyers, the supply chain people, the model, the climate scientists, the land use people, um, the um, supply chain experts, we're all going to go together and produce um, a mapping exercise uh, of what's happening at the moment. And then what we're going to do is take that research and test it. 
um, on the ground. We've got some amazing stakeholders um, that we're working with uh, across the planet, really. Um, and we're going to sense check what we're doing with them. And there's going to be continual feedback loops between what we find as researchers and what's happening uh, on the ground at source and also through the processing and towards the end um, when it's imported into the UK. Um, we then get a really clear picture of what's happening at the moment. We're then going to say, well, what would we like to happen by 2030? Um, which is obviously a D-Day for climate change. Um, and we've, we've identified some possible hypothetical scenarios for the future that might happen. We're going to model those, identify um, which one of those is the preferable, um, and then we are going to look at how we get there, our transformation pathways. And only once we've done that will we start making proposals for change, uh, policy change. And even when we've done, we've made proposals, we're going to feed those proposals back through our um, complex methodology, as you see on the slide, um, again, and test it, and again, test it in the quote, real world. So that's very much a whistle-stop tour of, of the research. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to have questions or comments um, on the, uh, on the work. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that slide up actually, it might be might be helpful just in case anybody uh, wants to ask any more about it. Um, thank you very much. Just before I go any further, can you hear me? Um, not well. <laughs> so... Not well. Um, would it be best if you could manage the questions then in that case, because there's no point of me sharing if nobody can hear uh, Okay, uh, let's see. Um, there are two questions already posted on the, the chat. I can share them as far as I can. The first um, one was, okay. can you see them? Yeah, um, it's um, soil production. So just to answer racial questions, it's, it's, um, it's land use for soy. So it's, it's, global, it's global production, not just for the food and feed, so it's overall. Um, uh, in terms of chi, uh, is it true Sawyer's animal feed has a poor feed conversion ratio? Um, I wish I could answer that question for you. I'd need to ask one of my my team. Um, so uh, we do have a livestock expert on the on the on the team uh, who will be looking um, at that. And if um, Jonathan was here, I would ask him to respond. But I don't think so. Um, so why is the UK not self-sufficient in soy? Um, we're going to look at that question in a lot more detail, uh, Paul, but, th but thank you for that. Um, initial thoughts at the moment um, is um, it's cheap to import and expensive to grow uh, here in the UK. I know we're focusing more on uh, the production of soy into the, um, into the human chain, which I think is a bit more uh, lucrative than it is to produce um, soy for animal feed. Um, the other thing is that you can uh, you can grow it in the southeast of England and down into Cornwall. So if you look at the soy map, it's sort of very much concentrated down in the south. Um, yeah, I think it's just cheaper to import it. Um, is is a simple answer to your question, but certainly something we're going to be exploring and the possibility of what needs to happen with the sort of um, demand and supply of of soy into the UK in order to to create the market conditions to grow it here. Um, so um, it's both, um, so I'm just trying to follow the uh, questions. Oh my goodness. Um, so should it, should it continue um, and address the downside to a question from Steve? Um, thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about it is uh, one of the things we're going to look at is what would happen if we don't grow soy anywhere on the planet in the future, which I know is, is, a, is a scenario that my, sci my scientific colleagues find um, astounding that we're even contemplating, but I know is, is something that is being talked about within the policy environment. Um, and I think so one of the th so we're going to actually look at what would happen um, to the food supply chain if we didn't grow any soy at all and we didn't trade it and it didn't exist as a product. Um, 
In terms of its nutrients, one of the interesting things about soy as, as a protein substitute is there are uh, other better nutrient substitutes, uh, protein substitutes that will probably um, give um, better, if you like, um, would be a better um, substitute for meat. That's not something that we're looking at in this project, but certainly, Steve, it's something that we're going to go on and look at within GFEI. And if people would like to get involved in that, that would be great. Um, so stakeholders, uh, we have a bit of an army. Um, so we're working with the World Trade Organization, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the International Grains Council, in terms of um, institutional input. We're also working with DEFRA in the UK. We're working with, um, with the private sector as well. We've got a, um, a UK um, user of soy, uh, tofu. Um, we've got the World Wildlife Fund, particularly focused in China. We've got um, some producers and um, pr uh, pr producers of soy in uh, Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia and Paraguay. And we're also working with the Chinese Academy of Science in China to look at uh, the complexity um, of the, the Chinese market and, and how that affects um, the UK. Um, yeah, thanks, Stefan, um, for the input on the on the plants, on the soy production. That's really, really helpful. Draw everybody's attention to, to Stefan's comment in the chat. Um, so does it get traded as raw material or processed products? Um, uh, yes to both questions. So it's traded as both and are semi-processed. Um, in the terms of, of the commodity, it's traded as oil, it's traded as, um, it's traded as meal, it's traded um, uh, in various sort of stages of production. And yes, it does, it can affect the way it's, it's regulated. Um, so good point about transport. Um, we are looking at that, but only tangentially, Paul, I'm hoping that's something we'll work on. Uh, so timeframes, um, so a lot depends on our funder. Um, so if UKRI say yes, we'll be starting research next March or a decision in March next year, start the project in May, it'll run for three years. Um, we're hoping to um, be liaising um, at, uh, with policy makers, both globally through our stakeholders and nationally through DEFRA, um, pretty much from the start. Um, so in terms of impact, um, probably anywhere from mod six onwards, hopefully. Um, so main regulations, oh my goodness, um, that allow trade in soil produced through deforestation. That's a really good point. Um, what, what we have at the moment is studies that look at um, what's driving deforestation. Um, some would argue that the idea of global trade in a product creates market incentives to produce that product by lowering import restrictions. Um, and so, you know, basically pushing the costs of trade in that product um, onto the sources. So, um, yeah, I could answer that one for quite a long time. So I would say World Trade Organization rules, perhaps trade agreements, depending on how you uh, interpret them. And what changes are needed to reduce this problem? Tim Benton would say a change of ethos. Let's stop thinking about what we need to fix it and instead think what can the, pan what can the planet support um, rather than how can we actually move towards um, more for less, less impact. Um, so how can we do that? I'm just very aware of time. Effie, do wave at me if we're running out of time. Um, so we can think about it differently. We can think about the, the function of regulation differently. Um, and we could, so that's one thing we could do. We could also think about the kind of regulation that we have now and whether we can interpret it differently. So there's all sorts of, of things that we could do. Um, yes, Fiona. Um, yeah. This is Sarah, I'm just interrupting. Um, Effie is still having sound problems. So ah, great. Take over as chair. Oh, um, really? You have a couple more minutes if you're happy to keep going with some of the questions. Yeah, um, it, it's just so great that everybody's um, asked um, so many questions. So thank you very much. I think we've got um, 
a couple from David, uh, David Williams. Um, really glad you like the project. This is great. If you can influence UKRI, this would be wonderful. Um, let's see. Um, I think you raise a really interesting question that something that we're now thinking about a GFEI, which is are the problems that we're seeing stemming from soy as soy or just this that we want loads and loads of protein? And it's a really good question. And one of the reasons to do the research and focus on soy in the first place is to identify what's actually going on with soy rather than assuming that the problem is either lots of protein, needing lots of protein, or alternatively, that actually we are driving demand um, and, and through um, expecting cheap food generally. So, so what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do really with the project is say, well, let's look at the dynamics of soy before we get into, do we need more, are, are we, is it a problem of protein or is it a problem just of forest risk commodities, which is the, the sort of trendy approach to dealing with this issue. Um, and I don't think we've got to the bottom of that yet. And my worry for any kind of regulation in this area is that we'll end up regulating the wrong problem. Um, because that's what we've done in the past. So good question, something we're going to look to. Um, receptiveness of consumers. Yeah. Oh, that was another um, uh, an apologies to them. One of our stakeholders is which, uh, which is the UK consumer facing um, organization. And we're going to be working with them to uh, really sort of um, Sort of fit, sort of fit in with their. Um, they've do, they've done a large um, attitude survey of UK consumers in particular to to trade and the challenges of trade and the kind of food that they they want to eat. And so what we want to do is work with them uh, and draw on um, those studies for that information about what is it consumers want, what will they buy, what are they interested in, and you know who who will buy that, who who and and buy that, who are we excluding? Is this a problem of, is this a middle class problem? Uh, you know, rich people who can make the choices, um, making these choices, or, or, you know, is this an everybody problem? So, so yeah, um, it's a good point. Um, I, I'm still getting loads more questions. There no, are, there's, it, yeah, I think it shows yeah. how <laughs> well, your talk has been today, Fiona, and how engaging yeah. it is with everyone. That we've got so many questions, and, and I think I think that's great. And and I would would thank you very much um, for all your questions. I'm really sorry we didn't get to them. I think very quickly, um, just to answer a couple of the last ones that are coming through, and then I'll stop here. Um, I'm really keen to put law in the middle of the project. I mean, I would say that, wouldn't I? Because I'm a trade lawyer. But what I do find is there is a sense of we know what the issues are we just need the lawyers to fix it and that misconstrues what lawyers do and how we work and how we can work as well with other disciplines and i think we need to to actually start putting law in and start pro if you like problematizing law um, rather than assuming we know what will, will sort the problem out and i'd like to start there and, and then once we've got that sorted, then we can start asking these bigger questions about, well, you know, do we need more regulation or what do we need to sort the problem out? And I think I'll finish there. Thanks very much. And thanks Brilliant. to everybody for, um, for, for great questions. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. And the recording will be available on the GFEI YouTube channel afterwards and be emailed around. <laughs> thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>